Okay, so last week we kicked off a brand new series called... Okay, all right, you got it. I'm glad that you got that one. If you missed that answer, um, you really weren't paying attention. Right, we kicked off a brand new series called Thrive. We had a little tagline that says, Joyful Despite the Drama. And so last week I did a survey and I asked you what your favorite kind of like a genre of movie or uh, TV show was, right? And we, so we talked about some of you, it was action. Some of it was uh, sci-fi. Uh, one person said documentaries, okay? Um, so instead of uh, doing the survey here this week, I went out and looked. So I found some numbers. This is from a website called The Numbers, real creative, um, but here's, here's what the survey said. The, most, the highest uh, grossing genres in 2021, uh, first of all, was action, then it was adventure, and then horror, and then comedy, and number five was drama. And so we talked last week about how um, we are, through this series, learning how to thrive despite the drama, okay? And so we're going to talk a little bit more about that as we go forward. But if you remember last week, I said, quite frankly, all of these categories have drama in them, don't they? And here's the thing about drama. Drama, we always think about it as being negative. But drama just is kind of that anxious, exciting, something exciting has happened. And sometimes that can be good. The important thing is how we handle the drama that we deal with and face in our lives. And so that's what we're learning through this series. But before we go any further, let me just stop and say, welcome to Harvest Bible Chapel, North Iowa. For all of our visitors, my name is Pastor Terry, and whether you're joining us online or you're here in person, we really are thankful that you have joined us for worship today. If you are a visitor, or for some reason I haven't met you yet, uh, I, I would love it if you would come up and introduce yourself after the service. I'd love to get a chance to meet you. I'll be out in the, the welcome area. Or if you're joining us online, you can give us a call throughout the week. Um, even if it's over a phone call, I'd still love to get a, a chance to, to meet you. So let's go ahead and do what we do every week and open up our Bibles. That's right. We're continuing on in our series called Thrive. Uh, we're walking verse by verse through the book of Philippians. Last week was a kind of an introduction. This week we're going to continue on. And, you know, of course, most of us would say that we typically don't like to have a lot of drama in our lives. But the reality is, is it seems like we're almost addicted to it. I mean, we really can't go anywhere, watch anything, or really do anything without having some sort of drama pop up in our lives or on the TV screen or whatever it is. It really does seem like we're almost addicted to it. And some of us may be a little bit more than others. Again, we're not calling out names or anything. I love you. Um, But we know that to be true, right? So I want to give you a little bit of a, a quick backstory again on the book of Philippians. First of all, the book of Philippians was written by the Apostle Paul to Christians in the city of Philippi. Now, the city of Philippi had become, um, over the last probably 100 years or so prior to this, had become an important city because there was a huge Roman battle that was fought at Philippi. It was actually the battle that really changed, um, changed world history, and it for sure changed history for Rome because it was the battle that took Rome from being a republic to an empire. Well, after this battle was over, Rome took many of its soldiers, especially retired soldiers, and it planted them in Philippi. So Philippi was a Roman colony, and it had all of the same advantages as a city that would have been in the Roman Empire, even all the way back into Italy, right? The same tax laws and rules, and all of those advantages of um, citizenship and that type of stuff, meaning... These people, they were Rome through and through. They they were for sure all about the culture, and they were true Romans with others mixed in. So again, Paul is writing here 
two Christians in Philippi from prison. Now, Paul had been ministering at this point in time some almost 30 years. In fact, he wrote several very important letters from prison, including this book of Philippians. Um, Also, we talked last week about some of the things that Paul had gone through and given up to be able to be basically a missionary for his life. We talked about how he had been whipped many times, how he had been beaten many times. He'd been stoned and left for dead. He'd been shipwrecked several times. He gave up his life, y'all. Listen, Paul was uh, by birth a citizen of Rome. He was a Jew from Tarsus, but by birth he was a citizen of Rome. Paul's family wasn't struggling. Okay? Like, they were probably doing pretty well. Paul was actually then being, he was trained and was a Pharisee. He was one of the religious leaders, one of the teachers of the law. Paul was doing pretty well. He was on the the fast track, if you will, right? He was doing good. He was so much on the fast track that the the religious leaders of the time, um, right after Jesus' death, they allowed Paul to like travel around persecuting all of these Christians, But God, amen, but on the road to Damascus, Jesus appears to Paul and everything changes because he realizes that his his love for God was being missed on a love for Jesus, which is what he needed. And that love for Jesus changed everything for him. And for the next 30 some years, he's probably in his early to mid 60s here. He had spent his life and given up everything, say everything, everything for the good news of how people can have forgiveness of sins and salvation in Jesus Christ. So the book of, and here's what's, what's so crazy about this. Man, this guy was, he'd been tortured. He'd sacrificed and given so much. And after all this, you would think that Paul would be pretty bitter. It's been harsh for him. But the tone of this letter that he's writing from prison is a tone of joy and rejoicing. Paul wasn't bitter. It made him better. The drama, the struggles that he had faced, it didn't make him bitter. It made him better. And so the book of Philippians is going to challenge us, and I do mean it should challenge us. It's going to challenge us and teach us how to thrive no matter what we face in life, right? Our main point for the series has this, thrive despite the drama. And to thrive, it just means to, to grow or to flourish. Right? Now this, we're not talking about, oh, okay, so thrive in business or just, you know, how do I become richer? No, it's how do we thrive as people and as followers of Christ, no matter what drama it is that we face. Because here's the thing, we're all, say all, We're all going to have been, maybe even currently, are facing drama in our lives. Some of it a struggle, a difficulty. But the challenge is not just to survive, but to thrive. Amen? No more of this just existing Christianity, just getting by, just surviving. We want more life in our life. Amen? We want more thriving in our life. And so that's what we're looking at as we walk through this book here. So last week we kicked off the series with Thrive on Purpose. And we talked about our purpose. The reason we were created. The the scriptures lay it out for us. You have a loving God who created you on purpose, intentionally, and he did it for his glory. He created you to live a life that would bring him glory, right? He knows how he made you, and so he knows what's best for you. And when we live life for any other purpose, and I mean any other purpose, we're missing the point, and it means that we're broken. Again, like a toaster that doesn't make toast, we would call that broken. Someone who proclaims to be a Christ follower who's not living for the purpose of glorifying God with their lives, that means we're broken, So we want to fix that. So last week we talked about how we should thrive 
on purpose, our purpose to glorify God. Today, we're going to move on to thrive on mission. Let's look at our text. Our text, again, is in Philippians chapter 1. We're going to be going through verses 3 through 7. It says this, I thank God in all my remembrance of you. Again, this is Paul writing to the Christians in Philippi. I thank God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, for you all making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about you all because I hold you in my heart, for you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and the confirmation of the gospel. Okay, so in verse 5 here, Paul gives us one of his reasons for his great joy. Right? This guy has faced some drama. He's faced some struggles in his life. And yet he's joyful. And he gives us one of the reasons right here. He, he says that his joy is in the partnership in the gospel. It's in the Philippians partnership with him in the gospel. Now we kind of try to avoid church and ease around here. You guys know what church and ease is? Right? Church and ease is that kind of church lingo that typically only people who grew up in the church actually really understand. <laughs> but let me give you a little bit of more recent kind of church and ease, okay? So when I say that um, Paul's joy is in the partnership in the gospel that he had, today a popular way of saying that in the church would be that um, as Christians that we should be living on mission, Living on mission is kind of a, a new way of saying this partnership in the gospel. And our main point for today, again, it's thrive on mission. And Paul was joyful because the Philippians, they were living on mission. They were giving plenty of examples. So, and let me just stop here real quick. Here's, let me make it simple for you. Here's what living on mission really is. Living on mission means that you and I are called, say called, we're called to live as missionaries wherever we are. Amen? That means for some of you, some of you may be called to be missionaries overseas. The United States historically has sent out more missionaries than anyone else, although that is dwindling a little bit. But maybe that's your call. But maybe your call is just to be a missionary in your neighborhood. Maybe it's to be a missionary at work. Well, let me, let me just take out this word maybe, okay? Wherever you are, we are called to live as missionaries, to think as missionaries. Our focus should always be on our purpose to glorify God. And if we're living out that purpose to glorify God, it's automatically gonna, it's gonna cause us to do this. Like, where can I serve? Where am I supposed to be serving for the Lord? Where am I supposed to be acting as a missionary? Who am I supposed to be seeking? Who am I supposed to be reaching out to? That is what it means to be living on mission. Every one of us who claim Jesus as Savior has been charged with living on missionaries, living as missionaries right where we are every day. Today's focus, though, as Paul's writing this, he actually focuses on the partnership involved in living on mission. Okay? He actually says it's a partnership. The idea is, I can't do this all. Our elders can't do this all. One or two of us can't do ministry and the mission of spreading the good news of Jesus Christ to the world. We can't do it alone. We're not supposed to do it alone. All of us are supposed to be in partnership in living on mission. Amen? So here, I want to just stop for a second. Notice I'm wearing my You Are Love shirt. And I know some of you have picked up that when I typically wear my You Are Love shirt, it means I might have to say, hey, I love you a lot. Because this could be one of those messages that could be kind of difficult for us. I told you that Philippians is going to challenge us. This message 
is challenging. But we don't apologize for the word of God around here, do we? Amen? That's one of our pillars, unapologetic preaching. It's back there on the sign. It's throughout our church. doesn't mean we don't apologize for making mistakes, but it means we never apologize for the word of God. And as we're walking through this text verse by verse, we love you enough that we're going to stop and we're going to teach it, train it, and preach it, hopefully just as God intended. Are you with me? With that in mind, let's go before the Lord in prayer so he'll help us, shall we? Heavenly Father, as we continue on here for the rest of this time, I pray that you open up our hearts to your desire for our lives, that you open up our hearts to your teaching, your training, your purpose for our lives, your mission for our lives. I pray that we would surrender to this, um, that we would be uh, open and loving towards you and towards your word and your teaching. I ask this and I ask your help in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Okay, so... Thrive on mission. I want to show you three ways that we can thrive on mission as we go forward. And so now that we've prayed for our, our uh, rest of our time here, if you're ready to dive in, say dive. Okay, let's do it. Three ways to live on mission. Here's number one. Number one is partner in generosity. I want you to look back at the text with me here a little bit. We're actually going to take a couple pieces out of two of the verses here that refers to this partner in generosity. Text says this. It says, because of your part, uh, partnership, some of your texts will say participation, but because of your partnership in the gospel, here's the first part, from the first day until now. So Paul's going back and he's referring to how much the Philippian church had already been partnering with Paul in ministry. Okay? Then it goes on and says, for you are all partakers with me of grace. Listen, the Philippian church was the first church that Paul established um, as kind of a transition into Europe. He had spent time there with them. He started the church. He suffered in Philippi, and he was kicked out of the area. But the church flourished. Despite their own struggles, their own persecution, the church flourished, and throughout the years, they had supported Paul multiple times in his ministry. And Paul here is like, there's such joy in this for me. Okay, um, hopefully you didn't think you were getting out of some type of survey. So survey, no booze, by the way. How many of you are Hawkeye fans? Okay, I actually see some Hawkeye clothes and apparel. Right, somebody tell me, what's the Hawkeye colors? Black and yellow, black and gold, right? Okay. How many of you are Iowa State fans? Okay. Some of you are like pulling each other's hands down, and some of you hate sports references, and I love you. What's, the, what's Iowa State's colors? Red and gold, okay. How about, uh, we're in North Iowa. How many of you are UNI fans? Woohoo, okay. What's their colors? Purple, okay. Right, purple. Like the Vikings, right? Okay. I mean, I, I don't know why I added that part, but listen, in the same way, here's why I'm asking this. In the same way that those teams can be identified by their colors, generosity, hear me now, generosity is one of the primary ways that Christians are supposed to be identified. Did you catch that? If you proclaim to be a Christian, that means to be a Christ follower. And one of the primary identifying factors of us as Christians is supposed to be generosity. Because generosity, it shows love and sacrifice for others. And Jesus said in John 13, 35, By this all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. That's the call that we have as followers of Christ. Okay, now let me stop and remind you that I love you. And let me call out the elephant in the room here. This word that's being used here, uh, because of your partnership in the gospel, that word actually refers to financial support. Okay? That word there actually refer, it refers to 
um, either a financial or a possession support of the ministry. That's, that's what Paul is saying. This has brought me so much joy. Because in these times, you have supported the ministry of the Lord, this work that I've been doing, and you have supported it with your finances or with your possessions. Maybe they sent food along or what, whatever it might be. Okay? But somehow they were financially supporting the work of the ministry, and it was bringing great joy to Paul. <laughs> now, some of you might be like, well, of course. Like, I'd be pretty happy if people were giving me money too. No, 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 no. That's not what he was doing. This work was sustaining his ministry. Paul oftentimes um, would work even to continue that ministry. He was a tent maker. Paul wasn't building up his finances. He wasn't buying a jet. Not that they had jets, but he wasn't buying super nice carriages. Or Paul was using this for the advancement of the gospel in the Philippian church. The Christians there, they were supporting him in this work. So this is used to describe supporting the work of ministry financially or with your possessions or resources. Guys, we need to know that part of God's plan for the spread of the gospel is that Christians, if you're a Christ follower, say that's me, is that Christians would partner with each other to financially bear the load of the spread of the gospel. And I know sometimes that's a, a, a difficult conversation for people in church. Right? It's one of the least favorite topics that people will talk about in church, studies show. But we love you enough to make sure you know that this is so important to the Lord. This is why we as a church, we support an organization who uh, supports missionaries, who plants new churches. Guys, the numbers are down. The numbers are falling. There's more churches closing than there are churches being started. This is why we, again, as a church, we financially support an organization that does these types of things, right? It's called of all of us. And so when you start talking about this issue, so th these are the questions I get all the time. Well, the Old Testament says that, you know, we're supposed to give 10%. Uh, but the New Testament, you know, in 2 Corinthians 9, 7, it says, each one should give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Say amen to that. That is, so in the Old Testament, that was before Christ. We were under the law, and there was a law that we were to give 10% of everything that we gained to the temple, which like the church, Okay. Eh? Uh, 10% of your crops, 10% of your finances, finances, right? That was the, the command. Jesus comes along and he gives us a new teaching. And that teaching is that we're supposed to give out of the abundance of our heart, out of the joy of our heart, out of the goodness of our heart. And so people are like, so they'll ask me a couple questions. Well, what percentage should I give? And is that pre-tax or post-tax or... That means we're missing the point. And guys, I've been there. I remember being a young Christian going through this and being like, yeah, so is that pre or post tax? Like, help me out with this. Like, I want to, you know, how do I just get by? And we're missing the point. We're supposed to be giving. I'm not going to give you a percentage of your finances that you're supposed to give. It says it's supposed to be out of the goodness of our heart. Here's what I'll tell you for my family. I for sure don't want to stand before the Lord and feel like I loved him less than the people who came before me. And that I didn't give more graciously and more generously. Christians, we are called to be generous with everything we have. Because everything we have is God's anyway. And his call for us is to give back a portion of what he has given us. So here's what I would encourage you in on that. Whatever that percentage is going to be, settle it. Settle it in your family. Decide what it's going to be. Start there, right? But that is what we're called to do, is to join together to partner with each other in the spread of the gospel. Now listen, the financial part isn't the only part of generosity. We're also generous when we're, when we're loving to our neighbors and when we smile and when we spend time with, 
with people. It, we're, we're generous here at church. How about when, uh, when you drive in and our, our greeters are out there directing traffic and they smile and wave or you hit the front door and somebody says hi and good morning and waves and we're, every volunteer that serves here, you're all serving for the purpose of spreading the gospel and being generous in that is what we're called to. So there's other types of generosity. But I want you to catch how important this is. Verse 6 goes on to say this. Paul says, I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Everyone should say amen. Let me say it again. We'll just, we'll practice this, okay? I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will be, uh, will be, will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Paul is talking about our salvation. Paul is saying he's so encouraged. He's got so much joy that the Philippian Christians had partnered with him in this ministry that it brings him confidence, assurance. He knew for sure that they were true believers in Jesus Christ. That their salvation was solid, solidified, sealed there for all eternity. Not because of works, but because it was a reflection of their heart, of their love for Paul, and of their love for the Lord. Amen? Losing my voice. Because I didn't take a breath. Whew. How awesome is that? This is, um, many of you have probably heard, if you show me your checkbook, I'll show you what you love. If you show me where you place your resources, if you show me where you place your finances, if you show me where you place your time, I'll be able to show you the things that you really care about in life. And that's the, that's the lesson that we're learning here. And Paul's great joy was that the Philippian Christians were giving us a great example of how to live on mission. So we should thrive on mission by partnering in generosity. Okay, one, partner in generosity. You still with me? Okay. That doesn't mean this is the last one, by the way. Here's number two. Partner in struggles, right? So our series is our Thrive series, and today we're talking about thriving on mission. Three ways to, to live on mission. Number two is partner in the struggles. Look at Philippians 1, verse 7. It says for this, For you all are partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment, and we're going to stop right there. Okay? Paul is in prison in Rome. He's going through a struggle, and he's been in prison a lot of times already. He's already fought through this time and time again. And the Philippian believers, they were supporting him in his time of struggle. You know, uh, the city that I grew up in has three main hospitals. Three main hospitals. The name of those hospitals? Mercy, Methodist, Lutheran. Mercy is a Catholic hospital. I'll give you a guess on what Methodist and Lutheran are. Do we need to take a test? I don't think so, right? Listen, I understand that um, hospitals have become big business these days, right? But it, it hasn't always been that way. And as I say that, please don't take that the wrong way as if um, people who work in hospitals are just out for the money. I've spent some time in the hospital recently, and I was very blessed by the people who were there. Amen? Right? But I, I get that it's big business lately, but it hasn't always been that way. But the reason why we have hospitals named like this, or uh, Genesis hospitals, or what, whatever it might be, is because... It's because that Christians have always been the predominant force that ran towards people's struggles. Christians have always been the predominant force that ran into people's hard times. We were the ones who ran with love and generosity to those who needed help and couldn't get any. We were the ones who 
ran towards the struggle no matter what the cost, no matter what the risk. And their love and generosity, it's, it's exactly what God has called us to. Philippians 2.4 says, Let each of you look not to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Hebrews 13.6 says, Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. When the Bible says something's pleasing to God, I would encourage you to pay attention. I'm just saying, right? Uh, Galatians 6.2 says, Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. The law of Christ is love God and love your neighbor as yourself. We're not called at any point in time to live the Christian life alone. There is no lone wolf. There is no doing it out on an island on your own. That's not what we're supposed to be. It's not what we're supposed to do. If you are there, it's dangerous. It's dangerous to be a Christian on your own because you're supposed to have that support and fellowship and love. That's why we're supposed to not give up coming and meeting together. When plagues arose, Christians ran into the struggle. When Paul was in prison, the Philippian Christian ran towards the struggle. They didn't just send supplies and money, by the way. They actually sent their pastor. They sent like, one of their own. And it was a dangerous trip. So much, their pastor got sick while he was ministering to Paul or on his way to minister to Paul and almost died. We're going to see that later in the book. Like, he ran into the struggle. By the way, being a Christian at that time was a risk. And so him showing up to support Paul, that was a risk for him. But without fear, he ran towards that. When we focus on living on mission, living as missionaries for Christ, no matter where we are, then we will be more aware of the struggles that are going on around us. Our eyes need to be open. The eyes of our heart need to be open. If we're going to live on mission, if we're going to thrive on mission, right? Then we need to make sure we open up our hearts and our minds and our eyes to the struggles that are going on around us. So we thrive on mission by partnering in the struggle. So first of all, partner in generosity. Second, partner in the struggle. Here's number three. Let's try this now again. If you're with me, stay, say with you. All right, here's number three. Partner in the gospel. I don't know why, I just love saying that. I'm going to say it again. Partner in the gospel. So look back at the text, it says, it goes on to say this, right? So it said, for you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and the confirmation of the gospel. Earlier in the text, when he says, I have such great joy, it was because of their partnership in the gospel. All of this, all of this service, all of this sacrifice, all of this this effort that it takes to, to follow Christ. And it does take effort. Jesus said, if you're going to follow me, pick up your cross and follow me. Amen? It's great, by the way. Don't let me just put it like it's negative. Here, let's, let's catch this a little bit further. Paul's great joy was that the Philippians were partnering in the spread of the good news of Jesus Christ. The spread of the news about how Jesus Christ and faith and trust in Jesus could restore us back to a right relationship with the God that we had been separated from because of our rebellion. The good news about how Jesus Christ brought spiritual healing and life forever. Life forever in eternity in heaven. And it's going to be awesome, y'all. It's going to be awesome. I cannot remind you enough of this. Like, if I said this every week, it really wouldn't be enough. The promises that we have of no more sin, pain, heartache, suffering, it's coming. It is coming. At some point in time, whether we go to meet Christ first or he comes again, for those who have put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, that eternal life, it starts now. And it's going to get even so much better in the future. Amen? Numbers um, 
show a significant decline in church attendance. So here's what I'm getting at. Again, this is a partnership in the gospel. It's a partnership in the spread of the gospel. If we rely solely on this church service, we're going to be in trouble, guys. We're not really going to make the impact in North Iowa and around the world that we want to make. If it's just about this, we're not going to make that impact. It's got to be about all of us going out and living on mission and spreading the good news of Jesus Christ. It's a call to all of us. Say all. It's a call for all of us. Matthew 28. It says, go therefore. This is one of the last things that Jesus said right before he goes up to heaven. He says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe or obey all that I have commanded you. That's a mission for all of us. Go. There's three commandments there. The first one is go. You actually have to be intentional and make a decision that you're going to go. That you're going to go to Africa or you're going to go to Clear Lake or Mason City or Belmont, Clemmie, Thornton, Forest City, wherever it is. Or you're going to go to Principal or Hy-Vee or Titan Pro or Cabin Coffee, wherever it is that you go for work wherever you do life, that you're going to go with the purpose of, it goes on to say, baptizing, making disciples of all nations, right? Making disciples, baptizing. Baptizing, it's not even just physically talking about dunking people. I love saying that about baptism. I don't know why. It's not about that. It's about getting people connected to Christ. That's what baptism is. It's about getting people connected to Christ and then teaching them to obey all that he has commanded us. So my question for you is, how many people, when you stand before Christ, when your time comes, how many people are going to be in eternity that are going to be able to say that Jesus Christ used you to reach them with the good news about the forgiveness of sins? Because what greater reward could there be How many people are going to be there and be able to say that God used you to tell them the good news about Jesus Christ so that they could have eternal life and the forgiveness of sins? As our worship team comes forward, I really want to challenge you with one thing, but I'm going to give you some subparts here. Are you ready? I don't think you're ready. Are you ready? Okay. As our worship team is coming forward, Um, we're going to close out our service with the song, Yes, I Will. Yes, I Will is all about how we're going to praise and worship God. We're going to lift him high, even in the struggles, right? And sometimes we get too focused on the struggles because honestly, sometimes it's harder to live for Christ when things are going well, are you, right? But no matter what we face, that we're going to live for Christ. And so here's what I want to challenge you with this this week. I want to ask you to go home and sit down And ask yourself this question. How would my life be different if I was really living on mission? Last week I challenged you to ask yourself, how would my life be different if I was really living for my purpose of glorifying God? Right? Same question. How would my life be different if I was really every day living on mission? Thriving on mission? Maybe... Maybe you would finally partner in ministry by giving back a portion of what God has given you. Maybe you would pay more attention to the needs of those that are around you. Maybe you would run to the struggles, asking that your heart would be open so that God would reveal those things to you. Maybe you'd invite more people to church, or maybe better yet, maybe you would tell more people about what God has done for you. Maybe you would tell him what you were before you met Christ and how you met Christ and how he has changed you since you met Christ. Then help him get connected to the church family. Amen? So, this week, your challenge. Go home. How would your life change if you truly were living on mission? Let me pray. 
Father God, thank you again for your word. I thank you for um, the ability to just be able to walk straight through your word and learn what it is that you desire for us, that we don't have to question or wonder, but that you have laid it out for us. Father, I pray that as we go forward today and through this series, that you would help us have a, a heart and a mind and a spirit of growth that we wouldn't just survive this life or exist in this life, but that we would thrive for you in this life. And this week, particularly as we focus that, we would thrive on mission, the mission that you have given us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.